Assalamu alaikum and a very warm welcome to the show. My name is Anwar Mir and you are watching Let's Talk. Uh, basically, what we're discussing today is the Uyghur community in China. You will all have heard about it. Uh, you will know about the horrific uh, events unfolding uh, in China uh, against the predominantly Muslim uh, Uyghur community. Um, official estimates say about a, th a million people are being detained by the authorities um, in China. Other estimates suggest that it's as many as three million people uh, who are being detained. Now, these are numbers that one would have difficulty actually visualizing, fathoming it. So basically, because of the nature of the matter, because of the fact that Muslims throughout the world seem to be having issues, but uh, largely uh, the situation of the Uyghur community in China is being ignored comparative to the actual numbers involved. It is, as I say, and I used the word horrific earlier, it's actually uh, not only horrific, but it's actually a bizarre situation which the international community does not appear to be uh, responding to in accordance with uh, the numbers at stake. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, a very serious topic indeed. Uh, ramifications and consequences are shedding light on uh, patterns of uh, uh, behavior against Muslims in other far-flung corners of the world as well. And in order to discuss this topic with me today, uh, I have a very distinguished guest indeed. He is the editor of Asian Affairs magazine, a prominent international uh, magazine. He also served with the BBC World Service for 15 years as a very distinguished correspondent. And um, uh, it, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Duncan Bartlett as our expert today. Duncan, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me onto the program, Anwar. You're, you're most welcome. Now, just before we start and, and hear from our expert a little bit more about the uh, the topic today. Um, I'd like to remind you that this, is, of course, is a, an interactive show. Should you wish to participate in any way, either uh, posing a question or indeed leaving a comment of your own, then uh, this is your chance. Do call us uh, on the number that will shortly be available at the bottom of your screens, and uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say. So turning to Duncan, ladies and gentlemen, at the moment, uh, if we could have, please, a very brief synopsis of uh, the we uh, community and uh, exactly what's going on there as we speak in labor's terms well china is a huge country isn't it with a population of more than a billion people but there are some ethnic minorities within china and one of the significant ones is the uyghur population who live in the xinjiang province of china there are about 11 million uyghurs in total and their way of life is quite distinctly different to the majority of Chinese people. They speak a different language. The majority of them follow the Sunni Muslim religion. They have different food culture. They have different music and they have different art forms, different ways of life. In particular, they haven't really subscribed to the ideology of the Communist Party of China. Most of the Chinese ethnic, minor, uh, ethnic population are Han Chinese, and most of them uh, agree in principle with the ideas of the Chinese Communist Party. But there has been unrest within the Uyghur community about the uh, communist ideas, I think partly because of their religious convictions, and also because they feel as though they have been marginalized and excluded from the decision-making process in terms of politics. And from time to time, particularly about four or five years ago, uh, their frustration and anger um, was expressed through terrorism and violence against the uh, Han Chinese. So there was an attack on a railway station, uh, and there was even an attack staged by Uyghur separatists in Tiananmen Square in the heart of Beijing. This angered the uh, Chinese government, which has taken some pretty stringent steps, as you were saying at the beginning of the program, to try to control the discontent amongst the Uyghurs. The Chinese see it as being a war on terror. The Uyghurs see it as being an oppression of their human rights. Well, I mean, uh, thank you uh, for that uh, uh, brief synopsis of the Uyghur community. Uh, my difficulty is this. Uh, the Chinese government is saying that the, uh, the, the, the reason for the detention is because they're putting them through various training. They call them vocational camps. Um, they have given all sorts of 
in my opinion, very bizarre explanations as to the detention of so many people, stripping them, in my view, of the uh, fundamental human rights, which are supposed to be universally guaranteed um, and in accordance, uh, uh, supposed to be in accordance with international norms of behavior. Um, what is also rather strange is that um, there have been deaths in custody. Now, people are saying that the kind of deaths in custody are largely unreported, but they're known to be uh, uh, dying. There is a contingent of uh, Muslim people from the Uyghur community who are uh, based in Australia. Uh, they are saying that they have been unable to uh, have proof of life uh, of their relatives and loved ones in uh, China, uh, be people belonging to that particular community. Um, there are also... Um, other concerns, uh, and we may speak later on in the program about that, other concerns where uh, people in the West, governments, uh, lobby groups, celebrities, are suggesting that people's human rights should not be breached uh, wherever they are in the world. So you could be in Brunei, for example, if you happen to have a particular uh, orientation. Um, your human rights uh, uh, should be so protected that uh, people in Great Britain and in America uh, and prominent celebrities will stand up for those human rights. But where you have in China, as we speak, for sure, not Brunei where the punishment uh, according to the new penal code has yet to be inflicted and imposed, but as we speak in China, people are uh, not only being detained in their millions, but actually being extrajudicially uh, killed, disappeared, call it what you will. Uh, so that is a concern that uh, we may uh, debate later on. But according to your research, and at this stage maybe I should um, uh, just hold up your magazine, um, Asian Affairs magazine, ladies and gentlemen. It's a Mayfair-based magazine, as I say, internationally uh, renowned. Do look it up. Um, it, they do a, a tremendous amount of work of, um, uh, you know, intelligentsia-based uh, research on uh, current affairs throughout the world. Uh, but according to your research, I mean, how reliable is it that there are deaths in custody? I mean, have you come across any figures? Um, what are the Chinese governments saying? What are the Muslim governments saying, people of Muslim-majority countries? Well, one of the difficulties about this particular part of China is being able to pick up reliable information, and that's because the media in China is quite closely controlled by the Chinese government, and it doesn't allow for a lot of dissent in the media. I do know because I have heard people from uh, the Uyghur population in Xinjiang when they have been speaking to international reporters say that they feel that there has been an enormous breach of human rights. And there's going to be an enormous violation. And the particular concern that they have is that the people who are detained are detained without proper trial. And so when they're taken away and put into these detention centres, it's very difficult to know what they're being accused of. Some of the Uyghurs say, well, this is because they're being discriminated against on the grounds of their religion. For example, if women don't wear headscarves or if men don't show enough um, patriotism when they're asked to sing the Chinese national anthem, or perhaps they're reluctant to learn Mandarin Chinese and they want to speak their own language. The Chinese present this as being an opportunity for people to be re-educated. What they look for is to create a mood of social harmony. And so they don't want to see dissent and in particular they emphasize the value of stability. I think the other important point to mention about this particular part of China is just how huge it is. Xinjiang is something like four times the size of France and it is going through a rapid process of modernization, economic development. We've heard a lot haven't we over the past decade or so about the rise in China's economic power. 10%, sometimes more, economic growth each year. Well, Xinjiang, this province where the Uyghurs live, hasn't seen very much economic growth. And the Chinese say that's because it's unstable. It's because people haven't really signed up to the Chinese dream. They've got their own separatist aspirations. They've got a problem with terrorism. Once we make it stable again, then they can also enjoy in the economic growth that the rest of the country is enjoying. We'll build them roads, We'll build them airports, but we do expect them to sign up to the Chinese Central Communist Party ideology.
fascinating, Duncan, and um, uh, I, I will turn back to you in a moment. But ladies and gentlemen, um, I wish now to turn to our uh, other expert, um, a very well-known figure and a good friend of the community who's given his valuable time up to share his uh, thoughts uh, on the uh, various current affairs uh, throughout the world. He's a, a South Asia analyst and a lecturer at Essex University. He's, of course, uh, Abbas Faiz. Um, Mr. Abbas, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank um, you for having me. You, you're most welcome. Um, now, basically, in relation to the Uyghur, we've heard from yeah. Duncan um, a, a, an outline of what's taking place and uh, uh, his view of what the approach is uh, uh, regarding this particular issue. Um, share with us what, if you will, your thoughts uh, mm. on this issue. I think it's a community that needs support. It's a community that needs international support because their human rights are being violated left, right, and center. But unfortunately, I will have to say that they will not receive the international support that they need. And there are three types of people, three types, uh, three categories of people who will not actually uh, criticize the Chinese government for what they are doing for the appalling human rights violations that are, they are meeting out against this community as well as against the you know, rest of the people in China. And those are, number one, uh, Muslim governments, Islam governments in Islamic countries. They will not criticize China because they are like kind of bedfellows with the Chinese government. <coughs> In terms of, for example, if you if you you know look at South Asia itself, uh, in every single project that China is involved, there is a hand in that by Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia will not criticize China. Iran will not criticize China because you know of the weapons and the sale of weapons and all of that. Uh, the other Muslim countries will not criticize China. Now the in Western countries in the West where we live, there are again two types of people who will not criticize China. One is the hard left, because anyone against the United States is like somewhat, you know, a friend. So they will not criticize China because Ch they, think, they think China is the underdog and, you know, they have the right to really carry out whatever atrocities that they want to carry out. And then the third group of people, again, they are also in Western countries. And these are the hard right. The hard right, for example, you know, if you, if in the hard left you can include people like Jeremy Corbyn, and in the hard right you can include people like um, Boris Johnson, who, you know, travels to China frequently and has kind of um, uh, green tea in various places and so on. But these are the type of people who will not criticize China. At the same time, Ch the Chinese government knows that they are not going to be criticized. So they are not getting the really hard end of the stick from the, you know, in terms of the trade, in terms of, because China, very well, um, our friend was mentioning, that is becoming a global power. Uh, but Chinese global extension has actually created a situation where, uh, you know, tyranny has actually flourished in the world as a result of that. That's a fascinating insight, but what I, uh, uh, what immediately springs to mind is that you've uh, ticked off all those who will not criticize China, the enemy of my enemy, for example, and you've gone through the, uh, the, 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 the situation of various different uh, uh, parts of the spectrum, the hard left, the hard right, and so on and so forth. Uh, and what, the Islamic government. And the Islamic governments. What I <coughs> found interesting is that you did not mention America, who at the moment, and we're about to go on a break, but I will want to hear from you, mm -hmm. and I'm sure your view, our viewers will as well. Um, uh, in terms of America, at the moment, the, the circumstances and the relationship between them and China is very volatile. We know about the uh, mm. Huawei, I don't know how you pronounce it, to be perfectly frank. Huawei, we, Huawei, we, how you want to pronounce it. <laughs> very serious going-ons uh, mm. there. Mm. A lot of security ramifications as a result of the, um, the, the 
outstanding success of that company and how it is so successful that uh, you know there are fears that the the, the data mm -hmm. that they will hold will have serious security breaches not just for America but for the rest of the world ladies and gentlemen that is something which we will touch on when we return so please do stay with us don't go anywhere we'll be back in a very short while and we will uh, continue to hear from our experts uh, this very worrying situation that is unfolding uh, and has unfolded sadly for some time in China. Do stay with us.